Okay, read that. Thanks, Jerry. Well, good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm admitting right up front that I'm taking the easy way out tonight with my introduction for tonight's guest speaker, Evan Sayek. There's no need for me to reinvent the wheel when I can defer to such clearly articulated comments made by three well-known and respected, respected conservatives who have spoken to the forum in this very hall. David Horowitz says of Evan, Evan is simply the best political comedian working in America today. About Evan's book, The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks, Bill Whittle says, perhaps the most important book I've read in the past 10 years. And last but not least, Andrew Breitbart, describing the lecture Evan gave at the Heritage Foundation, says this, one of the five most important conservative speeches ever given. By the way, this talk at Heritage was the single most seen lecture in the Heritage Foundation's history. In his latest talk, again delivered to the Heritage Foundation in 2013, and the one he will be expanding on tonight, Evan talks about his unified field theory of liberalism to show how and why the mainstream media has gotten literally every major story of the modern liberal era, not just wrong, but as wrong as wrong can be, with their every mischaracterization benefiting all that is evil, failed, and wrong, while working to the detriment of all that is good, right, and successful. Evan has written and or produced in just about every medium that exists, including television, movies, and documentaries. He segued into politics after 9-11. It is worthwhile mentioning that he joins an exclusive circle of prestigious individuals, those who, I like to say, switched sides and became champions of individual freedoms, or conservatives. That circle includes David Mamet, David Horowitz, Andrew Breitbart, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, and Ronald Reagan. Not bad company. <coughs> Evan's career is divided almost exactly down the middle, his time split between his political humor and his more serious lectures. Dissecting and analyzing the liberal mindset is not a job for the lightweight. Both Larry Elder and Dennis Miller call Evan's book brilliant. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I recommend you do, and Evan will be selling and signing his book after the Q&A tonight. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Evan Sayed. I don't think it's so much that we switch sides, I do believe it's that we grew up. <laughs> There's this belief when you're a child in liberalism because there are no consequences to your behaviors. By definition, your parents look out for you, the school makes sure you don't get hurt, so you can have this fantasy life of, of being a liberal. Then you enter the real world, and most of us grow up. I, um, I think the lights are good enough for me to be over here, C-SPAN, and I okay? How cool is it that, that C-SPAN follows me wherever I go? <laughs> and the only thing is, you guys get to enjoy me. You know, I've heard me. But I was really enjoying listening to Rita. Brilliant, brilliant. That's, that's what I, was I, could, I could have gone on like that. I, um, I never quite know how to start these talks. Because having given that original lecture in, in, to the Heritage Foundation in 2007, the one my, my good friend Andrew Breitbart uh, called one of the five most important conservative speeches ever given. And Andrew Breitbart's story is just one more story the mainstream media has gotten not just wrong, but as wrong as wrong can be. What a good, decent man fighting for the right side, for truth. How can you be against truth? But having given this lecture that people started to call the unified field theory of liberalism, 20 different people sent me independently. Do you know what you have there? You've got the unified field theory of liberalism. Having explained it all, having explained why 
good, decent, otherwise smart people. Okay, I'm not talking about the ideologues. We know why the Marxist sides with evil. They want to overthrow Western civilization and replace it with Marxism. We know why the Islamist sides with evil. They want to overthrow Western civilization and, and replace it with Sharia law. Right? My cousin is not an ideologue. He's not a Marxist. He hasn't read Das Kapital and decided, yes, that's what's best for society. Right? He's not an Islamist. He's a Jew. Right? And I'm talking about your colleagues, and I'm talking, if I mention Barack Obama, it's not Barack Obama, it's the modern liberal. It could have been Hillary Clinton. It could have been John Kerry. It's an ideology, it's a way of thinking, and that's what I explained, forgive me for it, just happens to be true, to perfection. In that. <laughs> you know, but what am I supposed to do? It's true. So I have two choices. I can lie and be modest. <laughs> But having already explained it all, what's my next talk to be about? It seems to me I have two options. I can either give that original talk over and over and over again. How many of you have seen that original lecture? Then applaud because it's more impressive. Right, this is what I'm going to do just so I don't come off as, as I'm going to turn around and stick my fingers in my ears. I want you to tell the people who haven't seen it. How great it was. Go ahead. <laughs> so I didn't give that original lecture, and a good many of you in this room will be hearing it for the first time, but it'll be redundant, it'll be boring for, for you guys who have seen it. Or I can take the unified field theory of liberalism and show how it applies in the specific. That's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to show how the unified field theory of liberalism applies to the mainstream media. But I have a problem. In order to show how the unified field theory of liberalism applies in the specific, you have to know the unified field theory of liberalism, which means I'm back to giving that first talk over and over and over again. So what I've started to do is, I started my talk with a truncated version of that original speech. If you have not seen it, I implore you to do so. It's available on my website, evansayit.com. It's available at heritage.org. Um, it's available a thousand places. Find it and watch it. It's 47 minutes long. Um, in the original talk, I began that original talk by saying to the audience, and I'm saying it to you now with even more conviction. I said, I've got to imagine that just about every one of us in this room recognizes that the Democrats are wrong on just about every issue. <laughs> but what I said to the, the crowd that day is, I'm here to propose to you that it's not just, just about every issue. It is quite literally every issue. And it is not just wrong, it is as wrong as wrong can be. So in 2007, I, I said, for example, Give the modern liberal a choice between Saddam Hussein and the United States. He will not only side with Saddam Hussein, but he will viciously slander good and decent Americans in order to do so. Bush lied, people died. General, betray us. I pointed out in 2007, give the modern liberal the choice between the vicious, mass-murdering, corrupt terrorist dictator Yasser Arafat and that tiny and wonderful democracy of Israel. He will plagiarize maps, falsify documents, and engage in one blood libel after another, as Jimmy Carter did in his despicable book, Peace Not Apartheid. I pointed out it's not just foreign policy, it's domestic policy, it's social policy. So give the modern liberal the choice between promoting childhood abstinence and childhood promiscuity. They will use their movies, their TV shows, the schools. Jerry Brown will put in, into law that, that a 17-year-old that man can follow a 5-year-old girl into the bathroom if he feels like he's a woman. At the same time, a rather typical Democratic Party organization, NARAL, a pro-abortion group masquerading as a pro-choice organization, will hold a fundraiser they call F-abstinence. 
As I pointed out back then, it's not just F, it's the entire word, because vulgarizing society is part of the modern liberal agenda. So the question becomes, why? And for the full answer, please go watch that original video. Even better said, however, in my book, The Kindergarten of Eden, uh, How the Modern Liberal Thinks, because when you're writing, you can, you know, edit tabs and whatnot. But as that talk was going viral, a million people have now seen it. That's unheard of for a 47-minute wonkish lecture. As that talk was going viral, I was reminded that a theory, even in the softest of soft sciences like uh, uh, psychology, <laughs> philosophy, uh, political science, a theory is not accepted as true simply because it offers an eloquent narrative, or an elegant narrative, to describe things that have already happened. In order for a theory to be accepted as true, you have to be able to take that theory and then anticipate behaviors that have not yet come to be. Well, when I gave that talk in 2007, I couldn't have known Barack Obama would become the Democratic Party nominee. I certainly couldn't have known he would be elected president of the United States. Obviously, I couldn't possibly have known that as president of the United States, Barack Obama would bow down before some world leaders but not others. But yet my theory had anticipated to perfection that if a future President Obama were to bow down before some world leaders, but not others, it would be to the despotic king of Saudi Arabia to whom he would bow. It would be to the symbol of Japanese imperialism that brought us the Bataan Death March to whom he would bow, but not to the Queen of England. See, I couldn't have known back in 2007 that a future President Obama, and again, it's not Obama, it's any modern liberal, would order NASA to use its dwindling resources to honor one religion while spitting in the face of two others. And yet, this is what Barack Obama did, because I could have predicted he would honor Islam. Remember, he ordered NASA to use their resources to send a Muslim into space. Well, at the same time, when the Jews were imperiled in Israel, he snubbed, publicly snubbed, the Jew and made the peace-loving Dalai Lama exit the White House for a photo opportunity in front of the Barack Obama family trash. You see, I couldn't have known back in 2007 just who would and wouldn't give a future modern liberal president gifts. But my theory had anticipated to perfection that Barack Obama, a modern liberal, would accept, gladly accept, an anti-American propaganda book from the socialist dictator Hugo Chavez, while unceremoniously returning a gift of a bust of Winston Churchill to our allies in Great Britain. You see, I couldn't have known back in 2007 just where revolutions would crop up across the globe during a future modern liberal presidency. But had I known, my theory anticipated to perfection that a modern liberal president would oppose the democratic uprising in Iran, support the overthrow of America's ally who had kept the peace in, in, in uh, Egypt, Mubarak, and would call for a leftist coup to overthrow our democratic ally in Honduras. <laughs> See, my theory was able to anticipate every single one of these policies. Not because Barack Obama's a Muslim, I don't care if he is or he isn't, I don't care what he believes, I care what he does. Not because he is Barack Obama the man, not because he's black the way the, the, the slanderers and libelers would say it about us. It's because the modern liberal, there's something about his ideology that leads him to invariably and inevitably side with evil over good, wrong over right, the, the, the lesser over the better, the ugly over the beautiful, the profane over the profound, and the behaviors that lead to failure Amen. over those that lead to success. Yes. Amen. So what is that something again, the, the video, the book, but let me give you the essentials that you'll need for tonight's talk. Believe it, that's not even the talk, that's the preamble. <laughs> That's why I talk so fast, there's a lot to say. Um, 
the first two laws of the unified field theory of liberalism. There are four and three corollaries. The first two are what you need for tonight. I'm going to give it to you the way it's written in the book, and then explain it. The first law is that the modern liberal was raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. In the 1980s, by no coincidence, when the first post-World War II generation, the children of the 60s, when they became the professors of the 80s, when they became the entertainers of the 80s, when they became the journalists of the 80s, and when they became the Democratic Party of the 80s. In the 1980s, thinking was outlawed. <laughs> it was deemed a hate crime. Here's the concept behind it. Anything that you believe, anything that I believe, anything that you believe, even you, Mr. Cameraman, anything that you believe, is going to be so tainted by your personal prejudices. All right, prejudices we all have. It's part of being human. Prejudices based on such things as the color of your skin, the nation of your ancestry, your height, your weight, your sex, and so on. Anything that you believe is going to be so tainted by your prejudices that the only way not to be a bigot is to never think at all. <laughs> That's why their answer to everything is, oh, you're a racist, you're a homophobe, you're a xenophobe. Because if there's nothing to worry about, because there is no good or bad, then the only reason you could be against something is because you're a racist or, or a phobic. They were raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. And the second law of the unified field theory of liberalism Again, as it's written in the book, and then I'll explain. Indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of beliefs. Indiscriminateness of thought leads invariably, inevitably. There is no place else it can lead but deciding with evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, and so on. Why? Because if no religion, if no culture, if no person, if no behavior, if no form of governance, if nothing is better than anything else, then success is unjust. Why should a person, a nation, a government, a religion succeed if it's not better than any other? So this liberalism that says everything's equally good, bad, coexist. Doesn't make everything meet in the middle. It makes the better bad. Failure, as proved by nothing other than the fact that it has failed, is proof positive that some injustice has taken place. Why should a person, a country, a nation, a business, why should it fail if it's not worse than anything else? And by the same logic, just by extension, if success and failure are proof of injustice, then great success and great failure is proof of great injustice. And at a certain point, great and sustained success and failure, 6,000 years of Jewish survival, thriving when it's not oppressed, America the longest surviving and most successful democracy. Wonder why they hate America and Israel most, why there's this campaign to, to ostracize and destroy and Jimmy Carter will lie to, for, 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 for Jewish deaths. Why? Why? Well, so how is Israel the worst? They're not. But great and sustained success and failure is proof positive not just of great and sustained injustice, but that this injustice is intentional and part of an evil conspiracy. Why? Why an evil conspiracy? Think about it this way. Let's say you're playing roulette. No number is better than any other number. You spin the wheel, some people win, some people lose. It's not fair, but that's, you know, that's the game. But one thing's for sure, you can't say the people who won are smarter or harder working or better than the losers. It was just pure luck. But what if that same number came up ten times in a row? And the same people win, and the same people lose. Well, that might not prove conspiracy, but it's a cosmic injustice. 
Maybe you can see the losers looking over at the winner's pile and going, you didn't build that. <laughs> and demanding just a little income redistribution. <laughs> but now what happens if that same number comes up a hundred times in a row, and the same people win and the same people lose? Well, if you're at a casino and that same number comes up a hundred times in a row, you don't have to know how the conspiracy is done. You can sit around trying to figure out academia. Well, that's how they teach you. Well, that's how they teach you. <laughs> but the one thing you know for sure is that the game was fixed. So great and sustained success and failure is proof positive not just of great and sustained injustice, but that this injustice was intentional and part of an evil conspiracy. Okay, so those are the two laws that you need to know for tonight. They were raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. That indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of beliefs. It leads invariably to siding with the lesser over the better, the ugly over the beautiful, the profane over the beautiful, you know that. Um, are you guys with me? Yeah. yeah. Almost. Almost? <laughs> well, what's, what, what's it going to take? <laughs> I guess the rest of the speech. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask you again at the end. All right, so let's see if my unified field theory of liberalism applies to the mainstream media during what I call the modern liberal era, post-World War II through today. Why is that? It's explained in my book. But I think the first thing that I would have to establish is, is the mainstream media, has the mainstream media gotten every major story of our lifetimes, not just wrong, but as wrong as wrong can be? Yep. Yes. Well, let me begin to prove this by pointing out one of the good guys. And you know what, do I get to recommend the speaker if you ever get a chance to get Brent Stevens? He's an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal, and many years back, Brent wrote a piece that began something awfully close to this. He said, in a story, looking back at the contemporary journalism leading up to the major events of our lifetime, looking for clues in that reporting as to the major events that were about to transpire, will have found that reporting to have been mostly useless. Stevens is wrong. He's wrong in that he doesn't go anywhere near far enough. <laughs> that reporting wasn't just useless, but anybody who looked for clues at the time wanted, wanted to know what might come next, uh, uh, come next around the world, will have been led to anticipate exactly the opposite of what that actually came to be. Guys, I want you to think of our news media as our personal intelligence agencies. Make them operatives in the field, reporters, sending back dispatches, articles, to provide us with information, inside information, so we can make good personal policy. Fair enough? Well, anybody who trusted the mainstream media, ABC, NBC, CBS, Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, the New York Times, everybody but Fox. I'm going to put Fox to the side for a moment. We will talk about Fox. But anybody who trusted the mainstream media as their source for intelligence not only got useless intelligence, they got intelligence that was diametrically opposed to the truth. So Stevens offers some examples. Many of us in this room remember how stunned we were. Stunned at the collapse of the Soviet Union. How is it we were all caught so completely unawares? I mean, after all, an empire doesn't collapse in a day, a week, a month, or a year, any more than it's built in a day, a week, a month, or a year. So how is it that we didn't know this empire was about to collapse? Because to a point, Stevens is right. The reportage, the, the, the reporting, was useless. But it was worse than useless because as the Soviet Union was crumbling to non-existence, they were still telling us the Soviet Union was a co-equal superpower. Time for first for the strongest nation in all of human history when in fact they were crumbling to non-existence. This is not a little bit off, folks. Okay? This is diametrically opposed to the truth 
In this case, the mischaracterization making an evil empire appear stronger than in fact it was. And there's the paradigm. Not just wrong, but as wrong as wrong can be, always to the benefit of evil, failure, and wrong, or the detriment of the good, right, and successful. So Stevens offers another example. Most of us in this room will remember the contemporary journalism in the 1980s that was telling us Japan was an unstoppable economic juggernaut. This, as they were about to collapse into what is now a decades-long recession. Unstoppable economic juggernaut, decades-long recession. This is not a little bit off, folks. This is diametrically opposed to the truth. In this case, the mischaracterization making a non-Western culture appear stronger than in fact it was. How many of us, just leading up to or just immediately after 9-11, were stunned to, to, know, to, to learn that Islam had spread across a third of the planet, if not more? The most vicious, mass-murdering, homophobic, uh, misogynistic, I'm pretty sure they're anti-Semitic too. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> going on around the globe because not only was the reporting useless, but the mainstream media was telling us they continue to tell us that Islam is a religion of peace. The most murderous, hateful, and violent, is even not a torturous ideology of a Hitlerian ideology, a religion of peace, diametrically opposed to the truth. In this case, obviously, to the benefit of an evil, fair, and wrong ideology. You have to be a little bit older to remember Stephen's next example. Unfortunately, I now qualify as a little bit older than I remember it. But back in the 70s and 80s, when we were being told that Americans were, were it was like the wild, wild west. We, we, we were lawless gunslingers. In fact, Time Magazine had as its cover New York, our, our flagship city, New York City, ungovernable. We're savages. <laughs> Along comes Rudy Giuliani, and not only is New York City governable, it's the safest large city anywhere in the world. Ungovernable, the safest large city in the world, the, the mischaracterization making the good and wonderful people of America appear savage. I don't remember Stevens mentioning the Vietnam War. I don't know why he didn't, but a good many of you know that the Tet Offensive, which was reported as a back-breaking defeat for freedom, was in fact a war-ending defeat for the most murderous ideology in all of human history, communism. I can go on and on and on and list examples. Uh, Benghazi isn't, it wasn't an Islamic-coordinated attack. It was because of a video that was made six months earlier that nobody saw. It wasn't Islam, it was our freedom of speech. Right? I'm just going to add two more and then I'm going to get to the whys. Anyone who trusted CNN as their source for intelligence leading up to the first democratic vote, lowercase d, in Iraq, was told that our mission was a failure, that the streets were chaotic, that virtually no one would go out and vote, and those who did would be mowed down by Al-Qaeda. Do you remember the pressure on, on President Bush at the time to postpone, perhaps indefinitely, this vote? Talk to me, I'm live. I'm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and folks at home, you don't have to talk to me. I'm not live. Um, what in fact actually then really happened? Millions of Iraqis went out and voted. A higher percentage of Iraqis went out and voted in their election than Americans voted in our own election, which had taken place just a few weeks prior. Not only did millions of Iraqis go out and vote, but they did their fingers in purple, and they danced in the streets for hours. And to my knowledge, not a single one, not one, was mowed down by Al-Qaeda on that day. Virtually no one would vote, and those who did would be killed. 
Millions voted, no one was killed. That's not a little bit off, folks. That's diametrically opposed to the truth, making Al-Qaeda appear stronger than in fact they were. And one more example, anybody trusted the New York Times during the first battle to liberate 30 million human beings from rape, torture, and genocide in Iraq? Anybody who trusted the Times to describe that first battle said that we were pinned down. Mainstream media said our forces were pinned down. That was a bloodbath. In fact, the New York Times used the Q word. Anybody? Quagmire. When our forces arrived in Baghdad three weeks later, it was in fact the culmination of the swiftest military victory of its kind in all of human history. Yeah. Never before in all of human history had that much enemy territory been traversed in so short a period of time. Quagmire, in fact, the swiftest military victory in all of human history of its kind? That's not a little bit off, folks that's diametrically opposed to the truth in the New York Times, all to benefit a mass murdering genocidal rapist and torturer and to prevent us from liberating 30 million human beings. So the question becomes why? Because I don't think there's a single one of us here who thinks that Katie Couric is an evil genius. <laughs> right? on, 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 on both counts. <laughs> She, she, and she's far from a genius, she's an idiot. <laughs> and to show you what idiots journalists are, this is a woman whose greatest credential as a journalist was she was a daytime chat show host who once interviewed Paul Prudhomme and got his secret recipe. <laughs> that she is then not only delivering the news, obviously they know the news is a joke. But then to have the University of Southern California, the Attenberg School of Journalism, give her the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Television Journalism. If she's the most excellent television journalist out there, how bad must Wolf Blitzer be? So why does she do it? Why does she take every news story across her desk, flip it on its head, lie like, like NBC News edited the 9-11 call to try to make George Zimmerman, you know, that evil white Jew, oh wait, he's not Jewish, he's not white, the uh, white Hispanic. <laughs> Why do they do it? And what does Anderson Cooper do? And Anderson Cooper's not an evil genius. On both counts. <laughs> he's not evil, he's, he's a professional cutie pie. <laughs> and I, he does his job well. I'll, I'll tell you what he does. I don't go that way. <laughs> but if I did, I think Andy might be my guy. <laughs> That's how good he is. He puts on a black shirt, he looks serious, and he must be important. Why, why, does, why does he do it? By the way, it's not just those two. As I pointed out, it's across the, the board, except for Fox News, and across the decades. So why do they do it? And here's the answer. If I were to poll the great journalists of all time, and by great I don't mean the most famous, I don't mean those with the bluest eyes, I don't mean those with the highest ratings, I don't mean the richest, I certainly don't mean those with the most Walter Cronkite awards. <laughs> and I were to ask them, well I'm going to ask you, what is the single most important trait in good and accurate reporting. Anybody? True. Yeah. True. How do you get to the truth? I'm looking that, yes, the truth. Okay. In fact, would anybody have a problem with the word objectivity? <laughs> objectivity. Okay. Let me now introduce you to a man who is perhaps the most beloved and, and, and influential modern liberal of all time. His name is Howard Sin. <laughs> but he's adored. When he died, I mean, Springsteen wrote a song to whatever. Uh, Zinn, amongst his other accomplishments, is he's the author of the single most assigned text on America and American history in our public schools, or our private schools as well, primary schools and universities. This means that your children are learning our history from the man I'm about to, to tell you a little more about. 
It also means that whatever administrators picked that book to be the history book also picked all the other books that your children are learning from. And Howard Zinn, in a story, said, quote, objectivity is impossible. It is also undesirable. That is, if it were possible, it would be undesirable, because if you think that history should serve a social purpose, then you make your choices based on that. In other words, sin is an ideologue. The facts are important, advancing his ideology is. I don't think I get much disagreement even from the left that he's a leftist ideologue. But Katie Couric isn't an ideologue. So why does she do it? And it's because in the 80s, the hippies and the William Ayers who are now teaching at our schools, and, 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 and uh, the children of the 60s, they use their power because they recognize objectivity is undesirable. Why? Because it gets in the way of their stupid ideology. <laughs> right? Right? That, that sounds brilliant, Professor, but it doesn't work. You can't be objective. <laughs> are, those, are you sure that, that farm isn't productive? I'm pretty sure. You can't be objective. That's your bigotries. So they use the power because the, the, the ideologues who believe objectivity is undesirable to brainwash successive generations in the school, starting at the age of five. That's why my book is called The Kindergarten of Eden. And by the way, there's a book written by a liberal, by a liberal where he proudly, this is not a uh, self-conscious spree, this is not uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek. He is proud of the fact, this author, that all I ever really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> And it's true, because well, after kindergarten, you can't be objective, so all you learn is coexist. No, you don't coexist with that. You know, live and let live requires you to live. <laughs> it's really not that deep. But those who recognize that objectivity is undesirable to their utopian ideology use the schools and the other media, media to brainwash successive generations into believing it was impossible. What is it that makes objectivity impossible, anybody? It's the idea that anything you believe is going to be so tainted by your personal prejudices that the only way not to be a bigot is to not think at all. Thinking is a hate crime. So now the most important trait in good and accurate reporting is not only undesirable, it's evil. It's the act of bigotry to be an objective reporter. This, by the way, is why they hate Fox News. <laughs> if you don't hate people because they're wrong, we don't hate Katie Couric. We wish she wasn't an idiot. We wish she'd go, you know, do a daytime chat show like she is again. Uh, but, you know, we don't hate Anderson. They hate Fox News because Fox News is evil. Because Fox News reports objectively. And because they report objectively, they are far more accurate than are any of the other news networks. How do I know this? Because if you trusted CNN as your source for intelligence leading up to that first vote, the Democratic vote in Iraq, you were stunned when exactly the opposite of what they predicted came to be. If you'd watched Fox News, you might not have known it would be a million. You might not have known the color of the ink. You might not have known that nobody would be killed. But when what came to be, came to be, if your source for intelligence were Fox News, you were far less surprised by reality. If your source for intelligence during that first battle to liberate the people of Iraq were the New York Times, when what came to be three weeks later came to be, you were stunned. But if Fox News was your source for intelligence, you might not have known it would be three weeks. You know what? The time could have changed along the way, and so the reporting changes along the way. But when what came to be in Iraq came to be, if Fox News had been your source for intelligence, you were far more intelligent. When the Muslim Brotherhood took over in the Arab Spring that the leftist media couldn't tell us, because that would be bigotry. Don't they want freedom and democracy just like we do? No. No. Well, and 
you're a bigot. <laughs> so they could not report objectively. Of course the mother Muslim brother is going to take over. <laughs> Excuse me. Then they try talking every day for an hour. And then going, and then going out karaoke. <laughs> so now the single most important trait in good and accurate reporting is not just undesirable, it's an act of evil to be avoided at all costs and to be reviled when seen practiced by others. So, Katie Couric wants to be a good news one. Anderson Cooper wants to be a good journalist. Wolf Blitzer wants to be a good journalist. But the most important tool has been taken away from them. And what they substituted, what makes you a good journalist today, is that while you are never, ever, ever, ever an objective reporter, you evil racist, what you strive for is a word, a concept that sounds good. It sounds like objectivity, but in fact, is its exact opposite. The good journalist today, he's taught this in journalism school, it is the corporate culture at the New York Times and elsewhere. The good journalist is never objective, he is always neutral. Right. What's the difference between objectivity and neutrality? Let me give you a silly example. Let's say, let's say that like um, Keith Olbermann, <laughs> your history is as a sports reporter. Your assignment last week was to cover the New York Jets San Francisco 49er game. The Jets win 87 to 3. <laughs> it's my story. <laughs> Nothing to do with it, whatever. You just lost your audience. All right, you know what? Forget it. Forget it. I won't make it, I won't make it the Niners. I'll make it the Bengals. The Cincinnati Bengals. And the Jets win 87 to 3. If you're an objective reporter, your article is about how the Jets are a better team. And then in the body of the article, the most salient facts are the touchdowns and the interceptions and the sacks and the rest. But how do you know? How do you know the Jets are really a better team? How do you know that you don't just think the Jets are a better team, but you grew up near an airport? <laughs> and you always loved the airport. How do you know the Bengals? How do you know the Bengals are a lesser team? I mean, maybe it's just, maybe your favorite uncle was eaten by a tiger. <laughs> so to make sure there is zero bias in your reporting, zero, that's why they're so arrogant about it. There's no bias in my reporting. There's, you have to report that the Jets and the Bengals are equally good teams. But now you have a problem, because every story you write is going to be wrong. The Jets are a better team in my, in my story. The Bengals are a lesser team. But now the purpose of your article has to become, well, how is it these two equally good teams came to such disparate outcomes? Obviously, the Jets must have cheated. <laughs> But we're not even talking a little bit of cheating. It was like 1714. 87 long as sustained. That's got to be an evil conspiracy. After all, with that much cheating going on, why didn't the referees call more penalties? Like, forget it. It's a bigger conspiracy than I even thought. Because forget the referees. Why didn't the announcers in the booth say, hey, I just saw a holding? And who could afford who could afford a conspiracy of this size? The evil 1% is the club owners. <laughs> and now it becomes the Thomas Friedman's job to invent the narrative. Well, of course they, they, they don't want the Bengals and the playoffs have tiny little media market. The world is flat. <laughs> That's all funny. <laughs> See, the first time, this is sort of off subject, and, and I'm going to take questions and just, you know, this is what's going to happen. You're going to give me a rousing, rousing, just ovation. Um, 
then, then I'll take questions. But let me just expand this too. Um, that was a silly example, that sports. It's funny because in the entire entertainment industry, there is one aspect of that industry that is overwhelmingly conservative. They get just as rich, just as young as the, as the rock star or the actor or the actress. They're just as beautiful in their own ways. They have posters up on people's walls just as often. They get rich at the same young age, if I didn't already say that, and filthy rich. And yet they're conservatives. Anybody know who they are? Professional athletes. Why? Because athletes do things. It's objective. They catch the ball, they drop the ball. You don't have a university professor saying, well, it was bigotry. <laughs> you see, he's Muslim and the football used to be made of pigskin. <laughs> it's a cultural bias. No, it's <laughs> It's, it's funny, there actually is one other tiny little aspect of showbiz that is also overwhelmingly conservative. Stuntmen. <laughs> because they have to objectively know what they're doing. Right? Because if they're wrong, they get hurt. The actor only has to pretend to know what he's doing. And if you're like, Alec Baldwin, you get ten takes to do it. <laughs> So, that was a silly example of sports because it was, but what if you were raised to believe and then it was reinforced from kindergarten on when the leftists get a hold of you in, the, in, in your, your kids in kindergarten, all the way through elementary school, junior high, high school, college, graduate school, postgraduate school, journalism school, and then the corporate culture at the New York Times, that you're not allowed to report that any culture any nation, any form of governance is better than any other. After all, how do you know it's not just your prejudices? You must be neutral. Well, you know what? Barack Obama was asked point blank, do you believe in American exceptionalism? He gave a very clever, very politic answer in which he said yes, and then made it very clear he meant no. <laughs> what he said was, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism, and the Brits believe in British exceptionalism. In other words, it's not a belief based on anything other than the fact that he lives here. It's not our constitution he finds exceptional. It's not our Judeo-Christian heritage he finds exceptional. It's not our Protestant work ethic he finds exceptional. He just happens to live here. It's like being a Chicago Cubs fan. Oh. <laughs> you stop with it. Yeah, they're an exceptional team, so I root for them. But if America isn't exceptional, then how is somebody like Barack Obama to explain America's success? Our success is unjust if we're nothing special. And given that we are the most successful nation in all of human history, Barack Obama and the modern liberal has no choice. Well, they can give up their stupid ideology. But uh, short of that, Given that America is the most successful nation in all of human history, the modern liberal has no choice but to believe we are the greatest injustice in human history. And when you go back to the journalists, you wonder why they are so vicious and, 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 and they lie about Israel. It's because if, the Israel, if there's no difference between Judaism and Islam, then how do you explain Tel Aviv and the Gaza Strip? Yep. Yep. How do you explain symphony orchestras and the IED? Yep. Yep. How do you, if there's no difference, there's nothing the journalist is allowed to report. So they both want peace. That's what the liberal ha journalist has to believe. Otherwise, there's something wrong with Islam and they're not allowed to believe that. So if they both want peace, they just want to coexist. Then why do the, 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 the Muslims murder Jewish children and blow up buses in Jerusalem? That's the news story. Another bus was blown up in Jerusalem, let's say. God forbid. The journalist goes and says, well, the Palestinians must want peace, so why would they do something so horrible that Jews must have provoked it? <laughs> now they need to look for what that provocation is. But because the Jews didn't provoke it, they have to find something moronic. Ah! It's because a Jew built an extension on his home in Jerusalem. Now, any thinking person, that's, you, you've got to be a moron. But there's nothing else they're allowed to believe. It's the same thing with the reporting for Benghazi. If it was a well-timed, well-coordinated mass murder of, of our ambassador and other heroes based on Islamic fascism, 
then there's something wrong with Islam that's off the table. What could have made them do this? It doesn't matter how stupid it is that it was this video made six months ago. You and I laugh, and except for the fact that it's so horrible, but how moronic must the New York Times be to believe something so obviously stupid? And yet they have no choice. They have been morally and intellectually retarded at the level of the five-year-old child. Yeah. <laughs> Coexist. You know what that is? It's the lesson they're taught in the kindergarten class. All I need to know I go to kindergarten, don't hit. <laughs> you, and then you'll find it in the book. If you boil down the pseudo-intellectual rhetoric of a, of a Thomas Friedman, of a, of a um, oh, I, I have a, one of them I particularly dislike. But um, if you boil down the pseudo-intellectualism of the leftist professor, of the leftist journalist, of the leftist, leftist editorialist, to its essence, it is one of the lessons they learned in kindergarten extrapolated into pseudo-sophisticated language. So those are the two things I think you I think you understand. Uh, they were raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. Thinking is a hate crime. And indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of beliefs, or in this case, the articles they write. It leads invariably to siding with the Soviet Union over the United States, Saddam Hussein over, over America. Mass murdering corrupt terrorist dictators over Israel. Thugs like Trayvon Martin. Ben guys, just one story after another after another. The, the unified field theory of liberalism holds folks. And uh, I'd be very, very happy after the omission to, uh, <laughs> to, to take questions. Thank you so much for having me. Smart. 
because there was nothing horrible that could happen to an idiot. They were called the hippies. Amen. A hippie 20, 40, 100, 200 years ago, by the way, today, in any other place around the globe, would start to death. But with welfare programs and so much abundance and, 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 and whatnot, you could, a moronic ideology like Rousseau's, could at least find some followers who then were able to become the teachers and lecturers and the entertainers and, and the other things that require nothing but clever words. Okay. Next question. Why do you think so many American Jews are liberal? This is a simple question, but a not a short answer. I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. In order to be called a Jew, even to call yourself a Jew, is different than any other religion that's out there. In order to call yourself a Christian, you have to believe something. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you believe this, you're a Christian. If you don't believe this, then you're not a Christian. If you do believe this, there are certain rites and rituals and teachings and practices and behaviors that tend to follow. To call yourself a Muslim, you have to believe something. You have to believe that the Quran is the final testament of God and Muhammad is perfect messenger. If you believe this, you're a Muslim. If you don't believe this, you're not a Muslim. If you do believe it, there are certain rites and rituals, practices and behaviors that tend to follow. But to call yourself a Jew, you don't have to believe anything. All you have to do is plop out of a Jewish womb. All right, so let's call these Jews the plopping Jews. And there is absolutely no reason, sometimes they call secular Jews, I think Dennis Prager calls them the non-Jewish Jews. There's nothing Jewish about them except that action which was not there, which was involuntary. So why would you expect this largest section of Jews who aren't Jews to think in any way like a Jew or give a, a, about Jewish things? Then... Go for it. Go for it. Keep going. Okay. Then you have your three groups of Jews who are in any way Jewish at all. You've got in ascending order of practice and belief, Reform Jews, Conservative Jews, and Orthodox Jews. The Reform Jew has done one thing. Now, in order to be a Reform Jew, there are others who do more, but in order to be a Reform Jew, You've done one thing Jewish by choice your entire life. Anybody know what it is? No, Bar Mitzvah was you're still too young to, to make that choice. Circumcision. You now circumcision. <laughs> would, would, would you make that choice, man? Or maybe you have, sir. <laughs> fair to let you know my Jewish upbringing was as a plopping Jew. My, my, my Jewish experience growing up consisted of three days. At the age of eight days, people I barely met a week ago <laughs> took a knife <laughs> to my most sensitive part. They were so pleased with what they had done, they threw themselves a small party. <laughs> Twelve years and 357 days later, I said words in a language I didn't understand. They told me I was a man. They were so happy they had survived my childhood, they threw themselves a party. <laughs> Exactly 10 years later, I stepped on a glass and I was married. They were so happy I was moving out of the house. And they threw themselves this gala. So that, that was my Jewish upbringing. I've actually been trying to be a become more Jewish because Judaism, I, I wouldn't be a conservative because I'm a Jew. I would learn how to be a Jew because I'm a conservative. Because there is a Jew. The one thing they do, by the way, is they join a synagogue, the Reform Jews. 
But they don't join the synagogue to better learn and better practice Judaism. They learn, they, they join the synagogue because it's the local recreation center. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's cheaper than the country club. And while it's more expensive than the YMCA, they don't have to worry about getting naked in front of strangers. <laughs> I can tell you exactly when a popping Jew becomes a reformed Jew. If he's single, it's the first time he looks in the mirror and goes, oh yeah. <laughs> Where am I going to find somebody who thinks Marvin Hamlish is a catch? <laughs> right, you can't go to the country club, you got to go to the where there are Jews. Is that it? Oh, no, no, but one more quick point about this. There is a direct line, horizontal, not horizontal, a diagonal line from non-Jewish Jews to a little bit Jewish Jews to conservative Jews to Orthodox Jews that reject liberalism. The Reformed Jew, the, 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 the secular Jew votes Republican almost not at all. The Reformed Jew just a little more, the conservative Jew more, the Orthodox Jew doesn't have anything to do with the Democratic Party. Because modern liberalism is the antithesis of Judaism. The great gift of the Jews was the concept of justice. It was the first time there was a just God who expected us to attempt with, with our humanity to be just people. The an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, so often misrepresented, is really a call for justice. It, it's a call for not vengeance, Quite the opposite. It was the first time that they said the punishment shall not exceed the crime. I don't care who you are. Liberals don't want justice, which is why they insert a modifier before the word. They, that's right, they insert a modifier. And it's something they do over and over and over again to make concepts that we support into the opposite. For example, truth matters. Okay, it's important to be correct, but not when you're a liberal. Objectivity is undesirable. So they insert the modifier politically before correct, and it becomes the opposite. How is it that Jews are not a minority, but women who are a majority are a minority? Because they insert the modifier oppressed. The Jews aren't an oppressed minority, so it has nothing to do with the word. And social justice is the opposite of justice. So the more Jewish you are by knowledge, by practice, by education, the less likely you are to vote Democrat because Democrats despise the concept of justice. Before I get to the next question, I just want to point out you and I are both <laughs> there, there are more of us, there were, and we're growing. There's another. Right, next question. What, what's your view on Glenn Beck and his efforts to bring truth to journalism? Um, you know, he made a very big mistake in my eyes, which is charging. <laughs> so I really don't watch a lot of Glenn Beck. I mean, God bless him. I think that we have to come from. Uh, all different directions. I think there's a. I think Ann Coulter serves an essential role. I think Dennis Prager serves an essential role. They're very different roles. I think this is war. It's an ideological war. Thank God for the most part, it has not been violent. Although whenever there has been violence, it's been from the Democrats, like William Ayers and the terrorists. It's always been from the left. Al Sharpton and his tacit threat: no justice, no peace. You don't give me what I want, will bring violence. The violence has always been at least in my lifetime, at least since the modern liberal era, which is what I study, it has always been from the left. But I think this is an ideological war and we need every weapon, which by the way is why I got back into stand-up comedy. I've been out of comedy. I, I was a television writer. You know, I was a screenplay, I, I, I wrote screenplays, I produced documentaries. But after 9-11, when I said, my liberal friends are saying we deserved these attacks, that it was the chickens coming home to roost? That we were all little Eichmanns? And I said, i got to fight this war. And I said, what weapon is our side missing that I can bring? And I had written for Bill Maher for a number of years. I was politically incorrect when I was still a liberal. And I said, we need a Bill Maher from the right. And I said, that's what I'm going to do.
but, but, but without the prostitutes on my arms. <laughs> Have, have you been able to convert any of your liberal friends or relatives? And if so, how? Many, 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 many. And here's... And, and here's how you do it. By the way, except for the fact that my voice is starting to go, and I don't know what your rules are now and what the union rules are, <laughs> but I'm willing to answer questions because as, as a conservative in the Bay Area, I've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> that I call Adopt a Democrat. <laughs> because the good news is America is not divided in two. We're divided in three. There are those of us who get it. That right and wrong, right and wrong, good and evil, better and worse, ugly and beautiful exist. And we seek to conserve those things that are beautiful, that are good, that are wonderful, most especially in this room tonight, the exceptional United States of America. Yeah. And so we seek to conserve this, and that's why we call ourselves conservatives. All the way on the other side are people like my friend Rosie O'Donnell. Oh. <laughs> about whom there is nothing you can do anything about. She's a moron. She's an idiot. She's a troubled idiot. And this is how she gets out of her anger and thinks that she's smart because other people tell her how smart he is. she is. I'll tell you a story about Bill Maher, if I may. Remind me what I'm talking about eventually. So. <laughs> and C-SPAN, you have enough, have enough doubt in your life? <laughs> The two questions that I always get the most are why do Jews vote liberal, and I hope I gave a, a, a revealing answer to that. The other one is what happened to Bill Maher, because back when I was writing the show, he was a bit of a libertarian, he was even friends with Ann Coulter, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't this sick, radical, left-wing hate job that he is now. And I told them, and I'll tell you, the answer is this, Bill Maher has not changed one whit. Bill Maher was never a libertarian, he's not a liberal, he's not a modern liberal, he's not a left-wing fanatic. Bill Maher is a sick narcissist. <laughs> and a narcissist needs strangers to tell him how great he is. When we did the show out of New York City, after the show, you walk down, or take the elevator down, and you walk to where you're going. And you pass doormen, cab drivers, Workers waiting for the bus, construction workers. So if you need to hear, we love you, Bill, you have to appeal to people with jobs. When the show moved out to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, you leave the studio, you get in your car, the gate goes up, there are no doormen, there are no taxi drivers, they're there. That waiting at the bus stop are people who probably don't even understand what you're saying because it's in, in, in English. Um, <laughs> and you keep driving until you get to your gated community. Who's there to tell you, we love you, Bill? Susan Sarandon and Alec Baldwin and all the other rich Hollywood superstars. So he didn't change at all. All that changed was the city from which the show was being done. All right, so adopt a Democrat, you've got your, your people on the, on the left, the far left, and, uh, there's nothing you can, but there's, I believe the vast majority of people who vote Democrat don't hate America. But they have been so successfully cowed about who and what we are. They've been lied to. So I mean, my, my friend Ben Shapiro makes a great point. He said, in the last campaign, in the last election, both campaigns accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. The Romney campaign portrayed Obama as a good and decent family man who happens to be stunningly incompetent. And the Obama campaign portrayed, portrayed Romney as a dog-hating, woman-hating, homosexual-hating man who gives people cancer for money. <laughs> I don't know a single person who votes Democrat. I know lots of people who vote against Republicans. 
Because the left knows they can't honestly protect and defend their moral, that's why objectivity is undesirable. And if you were raised to believe it's, it's, it's a hate crime to think, because that's what we try to do, that's why everything we do is we are racist. So what you need to do is find, there's a whole bunch in the middle, I believe the majority of the people who vote Democrat, who have just, that's actually more feedback than the guns sometimes. <laughs> Um, who have never heard from a conservative what a conservative believes. Where would they have heard it? CBS or NBC? Where would they have read it? The New York Times or, 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 or the Washington Post? Think about this. There are three, I know this is the wrong word, I just feel more comfortable pronouncing it this way. There are three mediums that the liberal hates. There's Fox News, there's conservative talk radio, and there's the blogosphere. The Droid Report and uh, Breitbart.com and Truth.org, you guys should look into. Um, well, Fox News is only 15 years old. That means if your friends are my age, I'm 53, that means they were 38 before there was a single television news program that didn't advance leftism. If you want to tie the, the, the phenomenon of, of, of conservative talk radio to the syndication of Rush Limbaugh, that's what, 20 years ago? Okay, so I've been 33, already through all my indoctrination and education, well into my job in Hollywood, well into my family life where you don't get to pay as much attention, and, and, and so those, those talk radio and uh, Fox News, and the blogosphere, when did Al Gore invent the internet? <laughs> it was 2004 when some people in their pajamas, pajamas media, caught Dan Rather using forged documents to try to steal the 2004 election. It's the first time the liberals have been caught because of the blogosphere, which is why they hate it so much. So what you have to do is find somebody in your life who you know is not a brain-dead radical leftist. If you have one of those in your family, just love them. <laughs> and I'd say talk about the weather, but then there's global warming. So. <laughs> Okay. Okay, but we have nothing to do with the Dr. Democrat now. <laughs> it's important that it be somebody in your life, a cousin, a longtime colleague, somebody, who, because what they do is they dismiss us as Nazis and fascists and racists, which they can't do if you're their brother. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> and over time, don't pick every fight. Don't pick every story, don't pick every issue, most of the time talk sports or whatever. But when they say something particularly moronic, like, ah, oh, that guy shouldn't have made that video, no wonder they killed the ambassador. You take the opportunity to lay out the facts. And I'm telling you, by the way, it's like adopting a child. Every once in a while, let them win. It's good for their self-esteem. Yeah, let them leave the front door. But I'm telling you, over time, here's what I do. I, I, I write when I write at my friend's coffee shop. And I sit outside and I put out an Ann Coulter book just to piss them off. Because <laughs> she's evil, she's a Nazi, she's a fascist. And over time, as we became friends at the coffee shop, it became harder for them to dismiss me as this caricature that the, that the media portrays of us. So adopt a Democrat, and you know what? If you all change just one person, we double our numbers. <laughs> I, I guess we can talk one more question. Yeah, that's my understanding. We've got time for one more question. How does the mainstream media get away with sustained professional malpractice? Why do people keep buying their product? Yeah. First of all, they're not. You know, the New York Times had to sell their building and then use that money to pay rent on their building. Uh, you know, ratings are dwindling everywhere, but Fox, you see CNN, uh, CNN's numbers are the lowest they've been in 20 years. How, how much longer have they been around in 20 years? Uh, they, they don't, but what's interesting about, and I know this from Hollywood, is money is not the primary concern. Certainly not to the owner of the New York Times, who inherited his fortune, did nothing to, to, to earn it, and he really doesn't care. He'll always have enough money. He would rather the New York Times go down in flame than tell the truth. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you so much. Yeah, buy my book. Don't forget to buy my book.